So the UFO era ends, 91, ufology versus exopolitics. Look, it's, it's inevitable. You have one era leading to another. You have the people of the first era resentful of the new guys in town and the new women in town, I understand that. It, it's unfortunate, but it's probably inevitable. But let's be clear, exopolitics stands on the shoulders of ufology. Without them, we couldn't do what we're doing. The work still goes on, it's important, totally support it. Right? I, I, I regret the attacks that we're getting from many of the old guard ufologists. It's unfortunate, and, and hopefully it will subside in time, and I think it will. The ghettoization, tolerance, recognition, witnesses, these are some of the concepts in exopolitics, which I can go in at great length and I will spare you. The intellectual ghettoization is something I have talked about a lot. It is one of the formal mechanisms of the truth embargo in which the government isolates it. It, it, it issue, ridicules it, separates it, in a sense condemns it, and once it has done that, it has nullified it. And they have created an intellectual ghetto, right? The walls are made of ridicule, and if anybody comes along, an astronaut, a Pulitzer Prize winning psychiatrist, the moment they utter the words UFO or ET, into the intellectual ghetto they go. And that's it. They're nullified. If your university wants to take you down, you got a green light. That's what they did to Leo Sprinkle. He engaged the ET uh, abduction issue and they cashiered him. John Mack, they tried to destroy him. His death was an accident, though. Let me be clear about that. Intellectual ghettoization is a standard Machiavellian policy of governments going back thousands of years. It is one of the most effective and ugliest of all government policies. I encourage all of you to commit yourself to a world, and particularly a nation, from this point forward, probably from disclosure forward, that intellectual ghettoization will never, ever be a policy of this state, ever again. And anywhere else, for that matter. It simply can't be tolerated. And it's happening all the time. It still goes on because it works so well. If you watch the news and you see people trying to challenge essentially the consensus reality and you see the ridicule begin, if the, if the issue is 911 and you are dissatisfied with the explanations or the quality of the investigation, very soon you're called truthers. Not investigators, not citizens, you're truthers. Right? And when you come on shows like, you know, Oberman or, or uh, Riley, you're ridiculed, you're laughed at, you're insulted, even if you've got three PhDs. This happens all the time. We see it all the time. We tolerate it. It's got to stop, folks, because there's probably no more corruptive and damaging policy that a state can do than the intellectual ghettoization of people. And when you allow them to intellectually ghettoize you in time, they will put you in a real ghetto with real walls, with guards on those walls. And if you try to leave, they will shoot you. They do this all the time. We need to commit ourselves to a world where that can't happen. Tolerance is absolutely essential as we move forward into this, uh, this new era. Recognition is critical. The people in the, in the advanced evolving groups need to recognize each other because the mainstream is not going to. You've got to build up your self-esteem. You have to give each other support and you need to do it in an open way. And then the evolution of witnesses is critical. Witnesses, whistleblowers, I don't like that term, witnesses, Essentially, what are they? Well, they were Jesus' disciples. They were the followers of Buddha. Uh, they are witnesses to events and times. They come forward, they tell their stories. Those stories accumulated, they become history. We are built on witness testimony. A lot more than we're built on the findings of a scientist in a basement lab that sees something interesting in a particular spectrum, and the next thing you know, there's a new little law of physics. We are built on witness testimony. Our churches, even our businesses, are intellectual reality. When you start attacking the witnesses, when you throw them in the ghettos, when you threaten them, when you undermine them, essentially you're saying, don't come forward. We don't want to hear your story. Shut up. We want to live in a world free of witnesses, free of stories. That's happening, folks. If you watch, 
it's happening. There are two threads going on in our culture right now. One is sit down and shut up. I don't want to hear what you have to say. And the other is please come forward and tell us what you know. And the fate of human society lies in which of these threads is going to last long and which is going to finally fall off. Now, these are just some of the witnesses that have come forward. We have hundreds of them. Their witness testimony completely confirms the extraterrestrial presence eight times over. I've had people in my government confirm it to me. I have colleagues. We've had people in, in the government confirm it to them. Edgar Mitchell has confirmed it, and on and on and on. And I mean, you could do this all day long. And you're thinking, well, I mean, clearly then it's consensus reality. No, it's not. Not yet. All of this is still not enough for the government to finally say, yes, it's true. And that fact needs a lot of attention from a lot of smart people. When a government, in the face of massive evidence and first-hand testimony, stands and says, it's still not true, you need to know every reason why that is happening. Every aspect of the government, every thought process, every ideology that allows that state to do that, you need to pick that apart and find out exactly how and why that is happening. Because that is a fundamental violation of natural law. When the Catholic Church went to its people and said the earth does not go around the sun, it violated natural law, a higher law than any church or state could ever legislate or put forth. You can pass all the laws you want that says the earth doesn't go around the sun. They're useless. They're worthless. They're pointless. You get my point? You see? So when the United States government says there's no DTs here, when the, when the evidence is vast and overwhelming, it is violating natural law. It ultimately can't legislate it away. They can justify it in national security, and they did. I understand that. But at the fundamental base of it all, it's unacceptable. And, and, and when they continue to do it long enough, you need to know why. Because if they are willing to violate that natural law, if they are willing to deny that reality, then there is no reality they will not deny. There is no aspect of your world they will not deny. No aspect of your health, no aspect of your food, the production of systems, government, the, the financial systems. There is no reality related to that that they will not deny. And when they deny the truth and act accordingly, financial markets collapse, jobs are lost, pensions are gone, marriages are destroyed, the environment is destroyed, health systems collapse, you see where I'm going? Currencies collapse. If you walk up on the top of a 10-story building and walk off of it and say, I decree that gravity does not apply to me, you fall to the pavement and pay the consequence. Because that's not the way it is. Unfortunately, governments can get away with it. They can legislate non-reality and benefit from it, do all kinds of destruction, and go and live nicely in the Caribbean. You don't have that luxury. And so ultimately, the denial of this issue by the state is a fundamental breach of the social contract. And you can't allow too many of those, because you do that and you end up with no social contract. And when you have no social contract, folks, it's pretty much over, right? Find an island somewhere, dig a hole in the ground, because you don't want to be topside. Disclosure is about ending the truth embargo. The truth embargo is this. It is a policy initiated by the US government with the cooperation of the World War II allies to withhold from their citizens the truth of an extraterrestrial non-human being engaging in the human race. That's it. That's the truth embargo. It's not a UFO cover-up, which it was called for decades, because that is a problem, because it wasn't illegal. And if you're, you know, if it's, not, if it's legal, you, you're not covering it up, are you? You cover up a crime. You don't cover up a birthday party. And so by calling it a crime, we criminalize the people that did it. And thus we alienate them, and we need their cooperation inside the government. If you make the government the enemy, ultimately, and everybody in it the enemy, then you are essentially at war with the state. We don't want to do that. They're way too powerful. Too much money, too many bombs. And so you want to be accurate. It is a truth embargo, a policy, legal under the National Security Act, to suppress this information. It last, it started in 1947. It's exactly analogous to the emperor's new clothes uh, fable, Esau. Check it out. 
right? Read the fable. It's the truth embargo, naked. Disclosure, of course, is with a capital D. We talked about that. It's the formal acknowledgment of the ET presence. And where is it all going? One of those manifestations that I, that, that I mentioned before where people sense something is going to happen and they've got to express this sense, one of those manifestations is the New World Order. And it's getting highly politicized. I have no idea what the New World Order is. And I really wish George Bush H.W. had taken a vacation that week and never uttered those words. Because this really created a kind of a, a um, I'm trying to remember the word, it's a, it's a red herring in a sense. Every day that you wake up and, 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 and swing your legs over the bed and your feet touch the rug on your floor, you have entered a new world order. The world is changing every single day. That means the order within it changes, the structure changes. It will always be that way. The only question is not that we're going to have a new world order, guaranteed. The real issue is what will it be and who is going to be involved in it? That's really the issue. And so saying that there's some NWO coming and we must, you know, we got, you know, keep away from it. And we gotta fight and we gotta stop. What? It's a waste of time. What we should be doing is saying, okay, the world is going to change. Let's shape it to suit the human condition. Which means you've got to get involved. You've got to be an activist. You've got to do stuff, right? You can't just yell and scream, don't give me a new world order I don't want, and when it finally comes, you still don't want it. Say, well, they did it again. You know, got a new boss, same as the old boss. I mean, we've heard that for a long time. Uh-uh, no more. And why? Well, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a gentleman. They named the CIA after him for very good reasons. Because we are about to enter a post-disclosure world which is going to change in so many ways that you won't be able to keep up with it. And not coincidentally, in my opinion, never has the average individual, which 2,000 years ago was somebody in a, working a field in Palestine under Roman rule, with a couple of relatives maybe in Roman prison for saying something funny, with a short lifespan of maybe 33 years, no Novocaine, not very good healthcare systems by and large, hoping for something better, hoping that somehow things would get better, but knowing that they had the slightest chance of affecting the Roman Empire as a flea has of kicking a hippopotamus to the side of the road. That is the way the common human existed for just as long as we can go back, utterly powerless. Now, because of this particular avatar, a movement was created, a religion as it were, that given several hundred years was able to transform a little bit, substantially actually I think, a little more than a little bit, quote, the Roman militarist worldview. Of course eventually it ended up getting subverted and they started making wars based on that religion. But again, the effort was noble, but it took an enormous people meeting in catacombs in secret and sacrificing themselves as martyrs over and over again. It was rough, folks, but you don't live then, you live now. And this is a whole new ball game. Why? Because the same technology that has brought us the threat to our environment, the weapons that threaten our safety, has also brought us the most empowering citizen tools ever beyond anything that the founders of the country could have imagined, the great thinkers of Greece could have imagined, this is truly new. And of course we're talking about the interconnectedness of people through electronics, and of course we're talking about the internet, the most powerful invention of all time. All right? The computer was for a while, but the internet way past it. <laughs>